let's move to S132 and 120. And yesterday we did not hear from some folks and they are all here. Uh, we have about 45 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes. And we have uh, the uh, Green Mountain Care Board is here with three people. And I'm gonna turn to Susan to you. Uh, our, I'm, a, I'm thinking that the best way to do this is to have uh, a team presentation Great, and I'll, I will turn to Chair Mullen to, okay. to kick this off. And so over to you. Thanks and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it was a pretty fascinating conversation yesterday and a, a lot of uh, extremely important points were uh, brought out. And uh, I just want to uh, echo a couple and, and try to uh, highlight them. Um, Patrick Flood uh, talked about um, workforce and, and uh, the real need for primary care. And what we know is that in other countries in the world that have better health outcomes in the US, they have twice as many primary care doctors as they do specialists. And we have the exact opposite in the United States. And um, I was hoping that somebody would quiz Patrick yesterday because he seemed to indicate that he had some thoughts on um, how that could be addressed rather easily. And this is something that we've been working on for a few years and nothing ever seems to be easy. Um, I can give you some of the, the things that uh, um, we have tried. We reached out to uh, then Chancellor Spalding to try to get a PA program started in the state of Vermont. Um, for Cheryl, um, she'll know the history um, where the College of St. Joseph in Rutland tried to start a PA program and it, it wasn't the wrong thing to do. I think it would have made them sustainable in the long haul. Um, but unfortunately, they tried it at the end of uh, really um, when they didn't have the resources to properly foot it up. And I know that a PA program sounds like a daunting task, but when you're looking at um, the state college system in the uh, situation that it's in, there would be some stiff upfront costs to start that program. But boy, would that uh, really bolster the college system in, in the future years. So, you know, I just want to point that out. And also, it's not just uh, primary care doctors, unfortunately. It's everything from um, mental health um, counselors to especially nurses. Um, in my recent call with Northwest, um, monitoring their situation, um, Stephanie Brio, their CFO, indicated that uh, um, they have 21 travelers right now and the, the price that they're having to pay for those travelers has gone up exponentially. It used to be 200% of what it would cost to, to pay to hire a nurse in Vermont. It's now well over 300%. So she said for the 21 travelers that they have right now, they could hire 70 full-time Vermont nurses if those nurses were somehow available to them. So um, no system is going to be fixed if we don't address the uh, workforce shortage. Um, and that workforce shortage is driving up costs, as you can see um, with the levels being spent. So I, I just wanted to uh, make sure that I, I threw that uh, out there and um, kept that at the uh, front of all the work because a, a successful healthcare reform effort will only be successful if there's sufficient primary care providers and other providers to um, make sure the system works. And right now um, it's going back up exponentially again, the uh, problems that we're having with the workforce. So a couple points too, before I turn it over to Susan, because Susan's really gonna walk you through the comments and she's gonna be brief because um, we know your time is limited, but I just want to uh, uh, address one uh, comment that was made yesterday. Um, I don't lobby for things. What I do is I try to um, pursue the, the state strategy. You laid that out for the Green Mountain Care Board in Act 48 and in Act 113. And as a state regulator, um, we follow the statutes and the, the statutes right now are that the um, plan for healthcare reform in the state of Vermont is a move away from volume to value. And so I don't want anybody think that uh, um, I lobbied anyone on, on anything other than um, we believe strongly that uh, if the state strategy is to move to value, which we think 
is a very good strategy, then we as regulators are going to do everything that we can to try to make sure that we do move towards value. So um, just a clarification, I'm, I'm sure that it was really kind of a misstatement uh, more than anything else that was made yesterday. But um, overall, I thought the uh, conversation was great. And Susan will get into the details, but I just want to make sure that um, you do realize that uh, the more clarity that you can put in to the legislation, the much better off everyone is. And I just want to point out that, um, and Susan will get to this in her testimony, but the language around um, tying the uh, compensation of the executive team to the, the median um, salary of primary care doctors um, would be um, problematic for us to currently certify um, the one ACO that we have in the state and just want to make that very clear to everyone. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan who will walk through um, the sections. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Chair Mullen. And thank you committee for ha having us today. For the record, I'm Susan Barrett. I'm the executive director of the Green Mountain Care Board. And what I'll do today is I, I first want to touch on S120 and then I'll get into um, a general overview of the of S-132. And then I can go into sections, but you know, I'll follow your lead, um, Madam Chair, uh, and we'll go from there. So uh, for so so Susan, if, do you have this in uh, can we get this in writing? We do the testimony because yes, I'm yes. looking at our time and with Perfect. you know it's this that is it be, for us on yeah, the on this bill pretty much. Yeah, that's why we put it in right in writing okay, for good. that reason. Um, so first, in terms of S120, we support the bill. Uh, we look forward to the insights and the information that you're going to learn, or potentially, if the bill passes. Um, and we also want to offer any assistance to the committee that comes together, um, either in research or in data, in the regulatory and evaluation work that we do around the healthcare system. So that's S120 and I, I'll, I'll, I don't know if you have any further questions, but, but we do support that. Yeah, um, could I just ask quick, quickly, <laughs> Susan, <laughs> sorry. Um, in, um, I'm glad, happy to hear that. And I think actually having your assistance would be really helpful. Um, your, the data presentations that we've been getting from your staff and members have been incredibly helpful. I love them. Um, and I see Elena, thank you so much. Um, so do you, would it be okay to have you list, you know, referenced in the bill so that it's clear that, we, that this committee would consult with you or like a sort of an in consultation kind of language that, that would be up to I, yeah. you senator hardy yeah. but we would we would welcome that and we whatever you that. need for research or anything that we can do to help you we're always here great thank you i appreciate that great um, and then i'll just give a general overview of s132 and then again we have everything in writing so we can send you a section by section after this so we support the move to value-based care. Uh, we're committed to an all-payer approach to delivery system and payment reform. And we've experienced uh, recently, as everyone knows, some significant data disruption in the model due to the pandemic, so that it's really unlikely that we'll be able to test the true value of this model as we had anticipated because of this disruption, really for, uh, 2020 and really going into 2021 as well. That said, uh, we still see that we're going to have some clear lessons learned and we're seeing that and we, we're grateful for those lessons learned. We know that we need to keep moving away from fee for service, as I said, and that the um, these volume based payment models um, that we're looking at and the, the models such as uh, fee for service and towards uh, value-based payment and delivery system reform allows Vermont providers to focus on keeping people healthy and out of the hospitals and it address, addresses chronic illness rather than just treating the symptoms in a fee for service way. We must continue to increase fixed payments. The board has been committed to that um, from day one of this model. Uh, 
and we want to tackle the changes related to provider sustainability. And I'm just going to put a plug in for Elena here that we did produce uh, an update for all of you and for the legislature on the sustainability report. And um, whether it's over the summer or later on, we'd be happy to come in and run. Through. Actually, I'm offering Elena <laughs> to run through that with you. She's the expert. Um, so we saw the value of the value-based uh, programs during the pandemic, and we saw those fixed payments really relieve some of the pressures that the providers felt as when we were shut down and patients couldn't come into the offices. But we also recognized that they weren't enough because our scale targets hadn't been met because we need to do, we need to increase scale and we need to do that su substantially. Um, the, the current model, as we've said before, and I'll just say it again, it is provider-led and voluntary. We see the advantage in, advantages in increasing equity and in reimbursements that this bill addresses. Um, many areas of the bill re do require the board to create a system that shifts from provider-led and voluntary participation to one that is state-led. So this is a big lift, as you can imagine. Um, we would really wanna study that carefully and make sure any changes are done, again, very carefully to ensure that we're attracting providers to these models and that these programs continue to work for, for the providers, but most importantly for Vermont patients because we need to keep talking about the patients and how this is affecting them. Um, one thing, a couple of things on the ACO oversight statute, the um, Chair Mullen brought up Act 113. This statute, uh, it's, it's already very difficult to document a lot of the um, results, I would say, or, or just document in general, because much of it is very qualitative in nature. Many of the requests in this bill reflect work that's already been, been being done in this statute. Um, and additional statutory requirements associated with this bill would add to the administrative burden of documenting compliance with respect to the statute and add barriers, and that's on current participants, I would say. It could potentially add barriers to entry for other ACOs contemplating participation in the Vermont marketplace. So, it, it, there is no requirement that there's only one ACO. There's nothing in the agreement that says that. And, and we would be very open to other ACOs coming into the market. Um, I just close by, I mentioned the financial sustainability of our hospitals and the report that we just submitted as an update to you. Um, we're considering a lot of the things in this, this bill, a lot of the things you talked about in S120 in that work as well, just to tick off a few. We're looking at affordability. How are hospitals emerging from COVID? We know that there's really long backlogs of preventive testing that they need to get to so that we can make sure nothing is missed, like mammograms, like colonoscopies, and we need to support them in doing that. Um, we want to look at um, we want to look at how the hospitals are looking at health equity. We know that that is something that is going to be really important. Um, it, it's really important now. It's finally getting discussed more, which is really um, music to all of our ears. But we also know at the federal level, even at CMMI and CMS, they're also looking at this. Everything they're going to do, they're going to look at it through a lens of health equity, which is so welcome. And um, you know, the last thing we're looking at, and really the one of the more important things in terms of sustainability is we're looking at how the hospitals are going to survive in a value-based world. So in our current system, as we look at it now, how do they transition to more of their payments being paid for value? And that, I, I don't wanna take Elena's th thunder, but that's what she would cover um, when we do get a chance to update you on that. I have the um, section by section, which I can just run through quickly, or I can just send it to you, Madam Chair. Which would you prefer? Uh, why don't you Why don't you send it to us? Just okay. and if we if we can come back to it today, uh -huh. we will. But I think Great. it's probably best to do that. I do have a question for you. Sure. Um, uh, it's on S one twenty, and um, 
the there's a the charge given to the committee that would include um, the efficacy of Vermont's all payer accountable care organization model and changes that would be necessary to make health care more affordable for Vermonters or whether an alternative model would be more effective. So I'm just looking for your uh, comments on that, um, given that the affordability uh, relates more to hospital caps, budget caps, and long-term outcomes and quality, um, health quality outcomes. So, and it's sort of more Medicare Right now, it's a Medicare agreement, mm -hmm. uh, Medicaid, Medicare agreement with very, with little participation on the private side. So, I'm just wondering what um, your thoughts are on that. Sure. Well, I'll start, and I think Chair Mullen will chime in here because I know we've talked about this a lot um, at the staff level. <clears throat> um, let me just say that the board is committed to this model, to continuing this model. Um, there is, as I, as I stated earlier, we're, we're learning quite a bit and we, we know that it's not perfect, um, but we are making incremental changes. Um, in terms of affordability, that is something that we look at. And, and again, I'll, I, I might just transition over to Chair Mullen here, but that's something we look at in our rate review process. It's obviously something we look at in our, it's written into our rate review process. It's something we look at in our hospital budget review process. It's, it's something that I actually, and I think it would be very helpful if you, the legislature could define that, we would be open to that process and work with you on it, um, on affordability, because it oh, is, okay. the, the, the affordability in our rate review process is very, um, I would it's say undefined. Charge because I, uh, let, me, let me just ask this question, because yeah. I'm getting more information than, the, the, than I asked for. Um, I'm asking if you think that the, this committee is, is the right committee to do this assessment. That's all I'm asking. And oh, if, you, okay. if the committee is reaching out to the Green Mountain Care Board for the data, I, I'm, there are implications here for the, for the workload for you to do this. So I'm at, just asking that given that we currently have a CMMI evaluation mm -hmm. and that we recently got a letter back from the CMMI uh, and we also have the AHS involved here. So I'm, I'm wanting to know uh, your opinion about and your thoughts about, not, not an opinion, but a measured response mm -hmm. to this particular number. I, I would say that there is going to be, and it currently is, a federal evaluation of the all-payer ACO model. That's number one. That is being done currently by NORC and um, the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. and they have a contract with our federal partners, and they, are, they were delayed a little bit because of the pandemic, but they are getting out now to start getting information and evaluating this model. So then the question arises for me whether or not this is a valuable experience when perhaps some assessment of premiums and co-pays and rates uh, might be more uh, appropriate in determining affordability. So that, that, that's all, I, 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 go, I go in a different direction. <laughs> so. Uh, Chair Mullen, did you want to comment? So just along your, your uh, line of thinking, uh, Madam Chair, when you talk about um, the um, premium rates and things like that, the statute um, in some respects is uh, conflicting because it's designed that DFR offer a solvency opinion and set a range for um, the RBC, which is a measure of solvency. And so, um, Oftentimes, we don't believe that uh, a premium increase is, a, is affordable, but at the same token, um, we're kind of locked into this, the statute that uh, sets that range for their RBC. So it's, it's a conflict, and um, 
we wish we had some magic wand that we could meet both of those at the same time, but it's very difficult. <laughs> but so I, I guess, but I'm going back to the, to the task um, or the charge given to the committee here on the efficacy of Vermont's all payer accountable care organization model uh, given to the legislative committee. And I'm wondering, given that you may be included in this bill. And so that would be a request for your input on this. So I'm just wanting to know, is this something that's gonna happen between now and uh, November? You mean the federal evaluation? No, no, this is not, I'm looking at the bill. This is a right. task for, for, for six, six legislators. What I'm hearing you say, and maybe this is a good way to communicate, is to report back to you in what I'm hearing you ask. So are, are you asking, do we think it is appropriate for the S120 committee to be evaluating the efficacy of the all-para model over the next four or five months? That's exactly what I asked you. It's a very large task. Let me just well, say that. Oh, and so, I, but answer the question, is I, it something they can do? I, you know, I, I look at this and I think going out to visit with uh, people in the, in the state to talk about affordability, and this one is just layered on as uh, almost Herculean and something the CMMI is currently doing. So I don't, I don't. I think if you wanted to evaluate in the terms of like the federal evaluations, they evaluated the state innovation model, they'll evaluate the all payer model. Typically they are done year, like they come out a couple of years after the model finished. So I, I think, I, I think it be, also, oh, sorry, Susan. No, go ahead, Elena. I'm gonna add, I think it also depends what <laughs> you're defining the evaluation. So the federal evaluation is, a, is you know a comparison, it's a statistical comparison of outcomes and inputs. If you're thinking about stakeholder process to learn how it's affecting Vermonters, I think that's a, a kind of a different um, task and that could perhaps be done over a series of months. But I think if you're really looking at kind of understanding um, statistically, if it's had an effect that, I mean, number one, the data aren't there. <laughs> so I think that's one challenge in of itself, but it also, um, usually takes quite quite a bit longer to do. So the, the word that's in the bill, and then we'll, we'll move on because we have two other witnesses, but the word that's in the bill is the efficacy of. And so that's, that's significantly different from, so what do you think? Uh, you know, it's significantly different. And so please think about that and, um, and let us know your thoughts on that. I see two hands up. I'm hoping that they are quick questions and because we need to move on to two more witnesses. Senator Hooker. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Kevin and Susan and Elena. Um, I guess my concern is that with this question of efficacy um, and the um, upcoming renewal of the contract, how can we enter into another contract without knowing the efficacy of the program that has been in effect? And so that's what I think we're trying to get at, or at least my intent in this bill is to find out if we're doing, if the ACO is doing what it's supposed to be doing, you know, fine, go ahead, move on. If we find that it isn't, then we need to cut our losses. So that's where I'm coming from. Can I, can well, I Senator just... Hooker, I, I would just say that um, the problem is because of the pandemic, it's hard to say for sure. And so I don't think that the state of Vermont should be rushing into uh, a large multi-year extension, but I do think that there might be the need for a bridge period to actually mm -hmm. give the current model a chance to work. And um, unfortunately, you know, that might take you know, a, a one or two year extension or something to try to um, really get the facts on whether or not this is, is doable or it's a waste of time. Yeah. So, 
And I appreciate that. And I'm wondering, is there that, is that a possibility? We don't have to enter into a five-year contract. Everything's a possibility. Um, the way the uh, current agreement uh, works, we at the Green Mountain Care Board have to um, submit a report. Uh, I think it's December 21, maybe, Susan? December, um, end of this year. Yeah. That uh, we may. So I, I don't want to, I do, I do need to interrupt the conversation. It's, you know, yet again, mm -hmm. it's an excellent conversation, but we have two folks who were here with us the other day and who need to testify. And so I'm, we'll move on. And if we get a minute or two at the end, we'll come right back to this. I know how important this is to everyone.